This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. So thank you again for joining the Moral Imagination Podcast, for listening. Um, my guest today is Marcel Guarnizo, and I'm very happy about this. We've been trying to schedule this for a while. Um, he's a philosopher, a theologian. He, run an, he ran an academy in Vienna right after the fall of communism, teaching politics and philosophy and ethics. He also uh, was president of Aid to the Church in Russia. He's been all over the world and knows a lot and has studied a lot. And I've been um, really uh, delighted to be planning to have this conversation. In fact, this is really the first conversation of a couple that we're going to do on the topic of justice. And so we're going to start this one out by talking about some of the basics, why justice matters, what is justice, a proper definition of justice, and some of the types of justice. And this is a big thing that people are talking about um, all the time uh, in politics and economics. And so we're going to stop Instead of talking about headlines, we're going to go and make some distinctions and think about what justice is. So, uh, Marcel, thank you very much for joining the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you, Michael, for having me. I'm glad to have been able to accept your invitation, I guess, in this um, super abundance of superfluous podcasts. It's good to be on one that takes matters seriously and <laughs> thinks deeply about matter. So I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I uh, think I, maybe I need to read, thank you I, for the kind words, the super abundance of superfluousness. Um, that's going to be maybe my new tagline, Amid <laughs> the super abundance of superfluousness, <laughs> the moral imagination stands out. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's, we're going to talk about justice. Um, let's start. Why does justice matter? I mean, you think a lot about justice. Why does it matter? Why should, why should listeners listen to this, which seemingly academic podcast on justice? Why is it relevant? So I think that's uh, really a critical question in our time, and the answer is not a small one, but I'd start with a very ancient, ancient reply to the question nearly 400 years before Christ in Athens, right? The cradle of democracy, as it were. Aristotle is asking his fellow citizens a question that is really essential to the preservation of the democratic order. And namely, the question that he was asking was, what brings the polis or the city together, right? What unites and holds a nation together is the question that he is investigating. And his reply will be that what holds a nation together is a common understanding of justice, right? And that without this proper sense of justice, a nation, the polis, the city cannot long survive, right? So I think that's the first thing. That this is the answer to the question and the sense of justice is intrinsical to a nation's survival. In his case, he was speaking about a direct democracy. Mm -hmm. I think the other question which we see today is, reminds me really of William Yeats and his famous poem, The Second Coming, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. But there's this verse in that poem Turning and turning in the widening jair, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And I think this idea that we can no longer hear the voice of reason and we cannot get back to the foundation of justice is making it impossible for the center to hold. And we see, therefore, this destruction of so many things. And I think that's the foundational notion of a society is this common sense of justice. Three, I would say Plato in the Republic is addressing the same question. He, of course, taught Aristotle. And when he's thinking, when he's thinking about the origin of the city, he writes in the Republic, for what we laid down in the beginning as a universal requirement when we were founding our city was justice. Right? So it goes back to the same problem and the same question. Now, there's a fourth reason, which is a kind of a modern or postmodern problem, which is that the notion of justice has been transformed. There's been a paradigm shift, as it were, in the notion of justice. And I would say the transformation essentially is from a metaphysical notion of justice, let's say a philosophically well-grounded, rational notion of justice, to what people like John Rawls called political justice. And this distortion is causing even bigger problems 
at the level of the practical sciences, namely law, for instance, right? Law is a practical science, but it depends on a proper philosophical foundation for it to be properly exercised. And so Aristotle wrote again that true forms of government will of necessity have just laws and perverted forms of government will have unjust laws. So this is a first implication at a practical level in society. If your sense of justice has been lost, you will have problems and you will commit mistakes and injustices when you are passing laws, right? So the big transformation would be my second to last reason why this matters, that postmodernity has transformed this philosophically grounded notion of justice into what people like John Rawls, as I said, called political justice. And that distinction is incredibly important. And it is one that Cardinal Ratzinger was alluding to when he spoke about the dictatorship of relativism. That is to say that if there are no antecedent notions of justice, meaning to determine what is just, there is the ability to see the nature of the thing and what is owed to the thing, then justice will simply depend on the dictates of a procedure in order to arrive to what would be called justice. Yeah. Can I pause you for a second? Yes, of course. Yeah, I, th- I think let's, let's uh, articulate that again, because I think it's important. So sometimes I'll say, like, when you say dictatorship, when he, when Ratzinger says dictatorship of relativism, that's all relativism can be. It'll ultimately only can be a dictatorship because it's eradicated the philosophical project of seeking for the truth. And so now justice which is a non-empirical claim. There's no truth, right? In relativism, justice becomes really the rule of the stronger. It becomes arbitrary power. Can you comment on that? But can you maybe re-articulate again when you say Ratzinger, if there's no antecedent understanding of justice, maybe just develop that out a little because I think sure. in a sense people get, get it, people get it, but it's inarticulate. Like, okay, yes. wait, hold on, say that again. So let's, let's, maybe that's if you can get to that, you don't have to well, do it right now, but let's. Get, so let's I'm going to get, yeah. So once I get to the definition of justice and competing versions, I will talk about this more in depth. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So I think for all those reasons and by dictatorship of relativism, I think the very important distinction here is that Ratzinger is implying something deeper then a society has arrived to a dictatorship. That is not what he is implying. He is mm-hmm. implying something even antecedent, as it were, to the dictatorship per se, which is not really relevant. The, the real relevant part is, if the determination of what is just is not based on a solid philosophical foundation, based on the nature of things, the law will simply be dictated by a procedural um, a, a, a process or a procedural democracy, as it were. were or a dictator. It doesn't like, because this is where he says, that's exactly right. Because he says like, there are some things the majority does not have the right to annul, right? He's very clear. So I think that's a very important point. It's, so I'm going to get to that point exactly. So this that's the problem. Of course, I'm going to get to that once we define justice. But the real issue here is that you don't need a dictator to be already in the dictatorship of relativism. You right. have to be in a situation where law is just being dictated because there's no law above the dictate of a parliament, a Supreme Court, a Congress, right? Law is just being arrived to and justice is being arrived to as the consequence or conclusion of a procedural uh, process in a democracy, not because of an understanding of what is owed to others. Right. And that's justice. What's owed to others? So you're, there we go. Did, I you had go. Another, did you have another reason? You said there were. You said there were. There's Aristotle. There's Yates, Plato, Rawls, Ratzinger. What was the other thing? Um, uh, I just think that the way that it starts affecting other practical sciences, right? Law, economics, political philosophy. If you don't have a sense of justice, you're going to have problems in your interpretation of law. For instance, what is a proper law? What is a corruption of a law? You're going to have problems in economics. You're going to have problems in political philosophy and the proper understanding of the relationship of man to the state. So all of the practical sciences are going to be affected, whether you have a proper understanding of justice or not. Right. So it's incredibly important. And of course, we live in a society where the debate about justice and injustice is prevalent on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. but nobody seems to have a clear understanding of what it is. Right. So that's why justice matters. <laughs> so mm-hmm. 
so let's go to the question then. What is justice? Because I think you just laid it out. There's a constant debate. Everyone's using the term justice, social justice, racial justice, economic justice, right? What is, so let's start by asking what, what is justice? So I, I would start with a classical definition. There's definitions that are close to this one, but in Latin to begin, sum cuique, right? That's a classical answer to the question of what is justice, right? And that would translate to, to each his own, right? Or that they may all get their due, meaning that justice is that which renders to each one what is their due, what is owed to them, right? So it means to give to each what is owed is to enable or to arrive to justice, right? On top of that, there's the virtue of justice, meaning the just man, right? Which is different from general justice, like who possesses justice, right? And that would be a habit, right? Or a virtue that a person has that renders to each one his due with an addition here by a constant and perpetual will, meaning the just man intends constantly to be just, right? Regardless of the consequences, regardless of the conditions, the just man who possesses the habit seeks to always render the due to another person, right? Their right of justice, as it were, use in Latin, right? And that is very important because the just man is not acting congruous to justice because of the law the force of justice for the just man is the rationality behind the thing that they must do because they see that it is owed regardless of the law right so what is important here is that the just man possesses the virtue perpetually it's not a question of culture it's not a question of time it's not a question of the conditions of legal justice it is a question of rationally being able to see what they owe to others in society and i bring this as an interesting point because you may be familiar with the ring of power and the invisibility you're familiar mm -hmm. with that from yes. where well it's from plato and from tolkien Right. So it's a fascinating thing, of course, because Plato tells the story. And this goes to the idea of what is a just man, which I think is incredibly important to understand. And this is in the second book of the Republic. So Glaucon and Arimantus, who are Plato's brothers, are having this discussion about justice, right? And Glaucon tells the story of Gyges, who was a shepherd, he was in the service of the king of Lydia. And it turns out that there's a big earthquake. There's a huge gap on the earth. And he goes down and he finds this golden ring that is on this dead person. So he takes the ring and puts it on his finger and twisted the ring. And it gave him the power of invisibility. So the question that Glaucon is raising here is very important because Gygus uses the ring in order to commit injustice because there are no consequences. He cannot be seen, right? So he goes on to, you know, um, seduce the queen, and then they plan together on how to take over the kingdom. So Glaucus' challenging question was on the intrinsic value of justice, meaning is justice fo followed for justice sake, or is it followed because of the consequences if we are caught, right? or if it's followed because of the coercion of the law or something like that. So he asked the question, now if a just man come into possession of such a ring, claims Glaucon, he would use it to do exactly what the unjust man does, kill his enemies, have sex with anyone he fancied, get his friends out of danger, and all with impunity. Right. So that is the great question, of course, that if there is impunity, would we, we seek injustice? as opposed to even if the laws allowed things that were unjust, would we remain the just man, right? So the unjust law that doesn't punish criminality is like the ring of invisibility. And the question is, does the just man follow that or seeks not to commit injustice even if there's no consequences? Right. So the tradition is affirming that the just man pursues justice for justice's sake. So this idea of giving to each one what is owed to them, to give them their due. 
right? And this is something that reason can perceive. That would be kind of a classical definition of justice. Okay. I want, we, I don't want to do this. I, I, I want you to keep going, but I do want to talk about, I think later, how the law is a teacher and how the law can play a role in helping to create just men. Yes. But your point here with the Ring of Gaijus, I think, is what one is that would you do, are you just, do you have the habit of justice, even if there's no consequences? And I think it's really, a, I think, a quite actually beautiful point that I just want to stress is that the, an, an unjust action that is not prohibited by law or not punished is a micro equivalent of the ring of Gyges, right? Exactly. That That's you, what I'm trying to say. Right. And I think it's re it's really, really important because in every regime, including our current regime here in the Correct. United States, there we have the ability to commit injustices without any consequences because they're legal. Yeah, it's the it's the ring of invisibility, the fact yeah. that abortion is not punished, right? right? There's no you can do it with impunity. That is the ring of the invincib in invisibility. Right. Exactly the point. Right. That's great. And, well, and it's a challenge to us, right? Because then, then we have to think, okay, there's the didactic power of law, which we'll get to. But the question is, there are things we can do that are not punished, that are in, unjust. And so as for each of us, like for, for me, for you, for all the listeners, in, as persons, we have to challenge ourselves to be just. Mm -hmm. Right there goes to a really important point, which we're going to develop more. Why? this question of justice matters because justice is said right by Thomas Aquinas, by the ancients to be the most important of the virtues because it's dealing with how we treat other people. But I'll let you go into that. But I think I just really like this point about the, the ring of guidance is all around us. Are we going to wear it and act with injustice or mm -hmm. are we going to be the just man as my, one of the poems by Hopkins, right? He said the just man justices. Uh, so, all right. Okay. Keep going. So that's the, uh, we're, we're working through a definition. So we have this first part of the definition that uh, it's giving to, there's, there's two parts. There's just general justice, all right? And feel free to protect, correct me at any point. Yeah. But general yeah. justice is that everyone is given their due, what's due to them and what we're going to develop that. And then there's the virtue of justice. That is the, where justice resides, it's in the subject, the person who acts justly, right? So do you want to keep on, let's uh, refining this definition sure. of justice. Okay. So if we can appropriate that, that justice is to give to each what is owed, right? Mm -hmm. And the virtue of the just man to do so with a constant and perpetual will. Then the question comes on the determination of what is owed is dependent on your ability to see, as it were, the nature of things, right? Reality, as it were, and determine from that right? What are the rights or the, the use that that subject may have? So an example would be, for instance, slavery, right? Though it was permitted, right? Legal justice in that case, it does not mean that reason cannot see that a person of black skin is a human person and therefore you're equal, right? Reason can see that, right? Right. To imagine because something is permissible, you've acquired the right to now do it, own slaves per se, means that you are not the just man because the just man, even if they have the ring of invis uh, invisibility, right, that they are not going to be punished, that they with impunity could owe another person, their rationality should tell them that that is unjust because the same dignity is owed to every member of the human species where equal. So... That would be an example, right, of rendering to each one what is due, right? Right. And well, can I say, and I think this is also what you, you, you maybe you'll get to, but so in the classical, you know, the four classical virtues, uh, the, sorry, the, the four cardinal virtues from the classical tradition and on, on justice, prudence, temperance, and, and bravery, uh, justice is the highest, but prudence is the mother, right? Because prudence is seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly. So there's that, I think you, you articulate there with slavery, I think a couple of important things. One is the deep connection with prudence, seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly, and justice being able to do that, having, so having a, a purified intellect. And maybe we can talk about later this question of structures of sin, because what happens is our senseless minds get darkened, and then we're unable to see, because the legal justice could be a structure of sin, right, with slavery, 
for example, right? So that then you're born into this, into, and, and that comes from personal sin. It's very clear, right? It's personal sin, then gets, in a sense, institutionalized. And now we're darkened. And so this is a, this is a constant challenge. Uh, and I think this goes back right to the beginning of Plato and Aristotle. And like the, the just form of government has just laws. Uh, so anyway, I think it's, we're, anyway, that's, I just wanted to note that, but I think it, it's that question of prudence is, is important. Okay. So you've determined then, and so there's a connection to justice, to prudence and to reason to see, and, right, and to seeing the world as it is. Can you keep going? Well, the implication here is of course, that justice is the queen of the virtues for the simple reason that no act of virtue will be a good act if it is lacking in justice, right? Mm -hmm. So temperance itself must be moderated and ruled by justice, right? And all the virtues are the same. It can be distorted if there's a lack of justice, right? The proper exercise and the proper mean has to be reached, right? So that would be the point. So it's not possible to act virtuously without justice under any conditions, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, an example would be that um, a person has to, let's say, or the father of a family that has to provide for their family still has to consider other circumstances of how much he can work and how much time he really has at his disposal to fulfill other obligations that are necessary in justice to that person. So if you become a total workaholic, the pretense that you're doing it because you must provide for the family while abandoning all other duties, right, to your wife and to your children is going to be an injustice, even though providing for your family is a duty and justice. So you must do it in the right proportion and mean in order to preserve the act, right? So the work ethic that goes by excess into workaholic is clearly going to violate justice and no longer be a good act, for instance. Right. That's good. Well, it's also just something about it, like struck me as you're talking and is, um, we don't think of it this way, but a, justice is beautiful, right? In the sense that it, like we often think it's kind of harsh or whatever, but it's actually beautiful. It, it's it it it's a right ordering of your relationship to the world and to other people, and so it's something to strive for. And this is why I think it's like this beauty in it that had maybe I, that struck me in a, in a way that hasn't struck me before. Okay, keep going. I agree. It's really the virtue that regulates our relationships, the relationships between men and then the relationships between the individual and the community, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be another distinction, the distinction between the justice between two private individuals and then the justice that is owed to the general community and the justice that is owed from the general community towards the individual, right? Right. So that will be part of the distinction right. and definition of justice that probably we can go into now, right? Okay. Well, yeah. So that's before we do that, I think that's, that's where, let's kind of wrap this justice uh, definition or at least resummarize. So you made the distinction of the, you know, the just man, the justice. So just as we kind of have a nice solid definition that's part of the tradition, justice is? Justice is to give to others what is owed. Right. Okay. And, and in order to do that, you need to know something about the situation. You'll need to know principally about the order in, in justice in general, right? Not legal justice, the order of being, right? What is that being and what is owed to that being? And that would be distinct from legal justice, which will have to do more with contracts and other things in the civil order, which you have to observe, right? You have debts of justice also in that, which are not necessarily dependent on nature itself, but they're dependent on an agreement, right? Okay. On a contract or a promise or whatever it would be. Okay. So that right. distinction is going to come. Okay. That's good. So I, but I, I think you, that's important because you, you actually said earlier that the shift in the way we think about justice has gone from a metaphysical foundation of justice to a political. And you're here advocating or claiming that in fact, it's the order of being that's at the beginning of justice and that's metaphysical justice. And we have to start there before we can get any proper understanding of political justice or any commutative or distributive. And this I think goes back to the slavery question, right? So that it's in the order of being that one that people are equal and that they should not be owned by another because they're yeah. a subject. Uh, there's, there's obviously many examples of injustice uh, that was decreed 
to be something that one could exercise without any penalty, right? With impunity. I mean, easy would be, for instance, the Nuremberg laws passed in Germany, right? These were passed by a legal procedure, right? And the Nuremberg laws, which dealt with extreme racial discrimination, which would eventually lead to the final solution, but also other things like the denial of passport to the Jews, Mm -hmm. the obligation to have names that were Jewish, right? You couldn't even, you know, take your name, the impossibility of marrying somebody who was not of the German race and a a, a Jewish person. All these things were passed, many at the Reichstag, right? So legally, as it were, the procedure was there. But would one say that there was a due that, that there was no right of justice that was owed to the Jews just because the Reichstag decided to pass a law, right? So that's the point. Right. What was owed, the respect and dignity for the life, property, and all human rights of a certain class of individuals in society, not only the Jews, the gypsies and the Romas, right, as they're known, same problem, that just because the legal procedure passed it, it does not mean that you've acquired the right to expropriate them to – violate their dignity and human rights and that's the point that the just man will see that even if they have the ring of invisibility namely that they can do it with impunity they will still not do it because they see that it is unjust that they are of equal dignity there are many many examples of this problem today it's the same problem that martin luther king was writing about in his famous letter from a jail in birmingham Mm -hmm. the distinction between a true law and the corruption of the law and the obligation and conscience to not abide by unjust laws that violate the nature and and the the truth about being and reality okay that's very good excellent no i think that's i think that's a good summary okay so now let's move into making some distinctions. There are different species of justice. You talked about legal justice. You talked mm-hmm. about general justice. And there's two kind of key species that we talk about, which are called commutative justice and distributive justice. And commutative means exchange. So maybe could you walk us through that? What are the, the, these species of justice and, and, and how do we think about those and how do they work together? So after having sort of explained that the object of justice is therefore to keep men together in society, right? In this mutual mm-hmm. intercourse and what that's why it's so important. And Thomas wants to make the point, of course, that there could be, speaking of unjust laws before I go to commutative justice, that, of Mm -hmm. course, there therefore could be no human agreement to make it just to steal or commit adultery, for instance, right? right? Because by nature, adultery is an injustice against another person, namely the husband of that woman and possibly the children if they have some, right? right? So no legal decree could make that just or stealing or homicide, as it were, would also not be something that would be giving the due that is owed to another person. Okay. So right. so this is incompatible with what I will speak about later, this notion of political justice, right? That all justice is arrived by convention or consensus or agreement or a vote, right? Right. Now, the other distinction that has been lost besides the proper notion of justice, is the idea that justice comes in two species, meaning there are two different kinds of justice that we have to bear in mind in order to keep the rights that are owed, right, the duties of justice towards individuals, the community, the state, and others, clear in our mind. The first species of justice or kind of justice is what is known as commutative justice. And The basic idea here is that there's two parts to justice because one directs commutations, which we'll talk about, commutative justice, and the other directs distributions, distributive justice, which we'll talk about. So commutative justice is basically the order that has to be observed between a private individual and another. And mostly it occurs in the exchange of goods or services, Mm -hmm. right? And an easy example of this is obviously in buying and selling, right? That's where the notion of commutation is primarily found, for instance, in the free market, right? This happens all the time. And by free market, you mean? I mean, the ability, for instance, to have prices and or supply and demand regulate, for instance, prices, as opposed to a command economy where the state determines and holds all the means of production and you know, uh, is in charge completely of the economy, right? 
Okay, and we'll go actually, but just to, for like you and I have talked about this a little bit, but listeners, we're actually going to talk about how to think about market economies and other and other kind of capitalism and like many other issues and justice through, yes. throughout today, but also in future um, the discussions as we kind of look through these questions of justice. So that's going to come a little bit. I want to say one thing that's that is interesting. I, almost when I read it, both surprising and obvious at the same time. And that is, you talked about commutative justice first. So in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that contracts are subject to commutative justice, which regulates exchange between persons and between institutions in accordance with a strict respect for their rights. Commutative justice obliges strictly. It requires safeguarding property rights, paying debts, and fulfilling obligations freely contracted. And then, this is interesting, without commutative justice, no other form of justice is possible. Yes. And I think that's something like even, and I don't, I, we'll get into this later, but like there's a lot of people who are kind of almost like, oh, that doesn't matter. But actually, commutative justice is the foundation. Without that, no other justice is possible. So let's go and talk about. So I'll come out. I'll justice. come out. Yes, I'll come to commutative justice. So with an easy example, right? Yep. So for instance, I go to a store and I seek to buy an Apple phone, and the Apple phone is $1,000, let's say. So if they give me the phone, I immediately have incurred a debt of justice towards Apple for, let's say, the $1,000, right? They have a use, a right to $1,000. If I give the $1,000 in payment for the, that object which I have received, that is a commutative transaction that would be just, right? You have fulfilled your debt, which was in this case the $1,000 to buy the phone, right? Mm -hmm. If you hire somebody and you owe them wages, it is just that you pay the wages and that you pay them immediately in a timely fashion, right? That you not withhold the wages from the laborer, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So if you pay- The Bible takes that very seriously, as we know. Absolutely, right? One of the sins against the Holy Spirit, actually, right? So if you withhold the payment for the services, you're committing an injustice and the commutative transaction is an unequal transaction, right? You have not fulfilled your end of the bargain. So that's what a commutative transaction is or a commutative justice rules those exchanges between people of services and things. The important thing to observe here is that what you're looking at when you have a commutative justice transaction is to the exchange of objects, right? What is owed or to the exchange of the service being rendered, right? And interestingly enough, St. Saint, Saint Thomas talks about this, that this works in an arithmetical manner. That is to say, if you owe $1,000, you satisfy the debt by paying the $1,000. Mm -hmm. And something interesting comes up here, which we hear about a lot in our day and age, but don't really understand. We hear a lot of discussion about inequality, right? And inequality being a huge problem that many politicians seem to want to address. But when they speak of inequality, what they're talking about is difference of income, right? That's what bothers them, right? That the difference of income, some people are getting very rich, some people are getting poor, and that inequality is increasing. But in a classical, proper notion of inequality, the inequality is not measured by who has more money or who has less money. Inequality is measured by the, the lack or the inequality of the transaction, meaning if you give me the phone and I owe you $1,000, and I only give you $500, there is a debt of justice that creates inequality for $500, which I still owe. That's the measure of inequality. That is to say, the unjust gain that I have obtained by not fulfilling the commutative transaction and not observing commutative justice, that's the inequality. It had nothing to do with who has more money or less money. So it had to do with unjust gains. It didn't have to do with you know, being rich or being poor or having a business that is profitable versus a business that is not profitable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really important. The second that you see inequality, it's assumed that there is an injustice, but nothing's ever proven, right? Whether there's just or unjust gains. Having more money than somebody else does not signify inequality in the sense that we're talking about here, which would be an injustice. Mm -hmm. Right. I think let's pause on that. Just quickly, I think that's a very important question because there's a lot of things that come with inequality and equality. So like there are, for example, challenges of inequality 
right? We'll call that, we'll say unequal incomes or unequal opportunity that are not, it's hard, we have to maybe find a better word for this, that are not, they're not unjust, but they are maybe a social problem that we have to address, right? So if you don't have access to certain things, that's not a result of injustice, but it's maybe a social problem. And I think what your point is here, if I'm understanding you, is that before we can talk about all these really complex social issues, first, we have to make sure, what do we mean by justice? What do we mean by inequality? What do we mean by unequal incomes? And like, as we work out these distinctions, these aren't simply academic, pedantic kind of things. They actually matter in the practical sciences. That's why I think it's it's so worthwhile yes. for us to talk about this, because there are real, there are injustices that lead to inequality. And, and let's talk about those. But first, let's make our distinctions of what we're talking about. And that's why. So let's keep going. Commutative justice. Uh, it, Keep going on that. I think commutative justice is fairly clear at this point. And obviously, you see that what is owed to another person has to be fulfilled, or else there's going to be an act of injustice, right? A okay, question for you then. Let's let me just use the phone example. Right? And this is something I think about. <laughs> so let's say, for example, I don't know, well, you buy a phone or you buy a service from someone, and there's a symmetry of knowledge, and you think you're paying $400 for this phone, but they're actually like taking your data and you've maybe signed some uh, agreement that the Supreme Court justice, uh, you know, says he can't even understand. Uh, the chief justice of the Supreme Court can't even understand. You sign, but there's this kind of like a symmetry of knowledge where things are being taken from you. Uh, do you think this is a problem of injustice because there should be at least some symmetry of knowledge? There should be at least some awareness of what's taking place. H how do we think about that? Well, I think definitely in a commutative transaction, transparency is important because otherwise you cannot rationally calculate whether you want to enter into the commutative transaction or not, right? So we would have to speak in the particular about a specific case where one would allege that there was not enough information for the transaction to be just and had a person known about it, of course, they would not have engaged in that commutative transaction, right? So that it's would not be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect transparency of knowledge. It just yeah, has to be reasonable. Right. Sufficient that reason can evaluate whether they want to enter into that transaction or not. Right. So we'd have to discuss in the particular. But right. generally speaking, it's clear what is owed in a commutative transaction or not. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another species of justice which has been lost largely in the modern era, which is known as distributive justice. Right, that all things that take place in relationships between different private individuals or the individuals in the state or the state and the citizen are not only commutative, but they are ruled by a different species of justice, a different kind of justice, and that is known as distributive justice. Mm -hmm. The distinction here is that in distributive justice, we are considering in order to find the right mean, the proportion that is due the circumstances of a person. So we're actually looking at the person. We're not looking at the object that is being purchased, for instance, or the service that was rendered that we must pay for. We're actually looking at the circumstances of the person. And that result may be on, it can result in rights or things that are owed to that person because of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. So here, the notion of that persons are rendered, let's say, proportionate right, to their situation, things that are owed to them is critical. And it's very different from looking at a transaction by the comparison between the thing that you've purchased and the thing that you must pay for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the cause here of justice and the debt of justice being incurred is the conditions of the person. And the distinction here that Aristotle makes and St. Thomas makes is very important. It's no longer here ar arithmetical, $1,000 for the phone, right? Which is, you can calculate very easy what is owed. This is geometrical, meaning it is a proportion. So you're not looking at the thing or the objects of what is owed in the transaction, but at the person and what is owed to that person, right? Right. Your relationship of justice here is specific to that person. So this, the mean here of justice in distributive justice is a certain proportion of equality between the external thing and the external person, right? That what you give to the person that is owed that, right? Okay. So let, let's maybe uh, break this down. So 
to, let me uh, give this example. I think this might actually come from you. You helped me think about this. Here's how uh, maybe a way to articulate some, the distinction. So uh, we've given the example of the iPhone. I buy an iPhone and I get paid the money or whatever groceries. So there's commutative justice, the justice of exchange. Now I have children and so I have an, an eight-year-old daughter and my relationship to her is not one of commutative justice, right? I don't say, well, you know, you didn't make enough uh, money to eat. And there's no, there's, it's, it's a distributive justice. If I treat her in a commutative justice way, generally speaking, I could make a deal with her. Like if you uh, pick up all the games, I'll pay you $10. That's commutative justice. Okay. I have a dealer. But broadly the way I don't feed her because she, we're, we're in a commutative exchange relationship. I take care of her because I have, I owe her in distributive justice because of who she is and her person. Is that a... Right. So I would come to the examples, and I agree with your example of distributive justice, right? And I would um, like to make a previous point here. Mm -hmm. That is to say that distributive justice is seen as very problematic, probably amongst many conservatives and libertarians, because it has an implication of not being a free market transaction, a commutative transaction, but it has the implication that you're redistributing goods to another person, right? And the notion of redistribution has become, in many circles, the thing to fight against, right? And has become, in fact, kind of an erroneous definition of Marxism and communism that is you know, prevalent amongst conservatives. Can I give a quick example? This is, I remember years ago, I was talking to someone like, oh, and we were talking about distribution or whatever. And, and they were trying to describe the family as socialist. Like it's, that's socialist. To right. share. Like, no, like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. it was a complete, like there's a mass, it was a, a, a massive error, but I think you, you hit why it's a massive error because people don't understand justice and distributive justice. So yeah. I, I'm coming to that problem. Right. And, um, I would say in popular culture, a lot of this problem was made, um, prevalent in the work of Ayn Rand, right? Mm -hmm. Ayn Rand and, you know, um, her novels, Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead, but mostly Atlas Shrugged is dealing with this problem. She wrote that in 1957 and she was a Russian born writer and she had fled the Soviet Union when she was very young. And in Atlas Shrugged, which is a difficult book to get through. I remember William Buck F. Buckley once wrote that he had to flog himself to get through one of her novels, right? At the time of the publication, Whitaker Chambers wrote a scathing review of Atlas Shrugged, which is extremely popular in our day and age, especially amongst the libertarians and other classical liberals and other conservatives. She's kind of an icon of freedom and an anti-communist icon, right? And uh, Whitaker Chambers wrote a scathing review, and he would know about communism given his ex-Soviet past, which you're familiar with, of course. Mm -hmm. And if you remember in that book, in the second part of the book, chapter 10 to be exact. Oh, sorry, the, of, of Atlas Shrugged? Atlas Shrugged. I never you. flogged myself. Okay, you're going to need a lot of flogging to get through it. Yes, because it's probably over 1,600 pages. A mountain of words, as Whitaker Chambers described. <laughs> yeah. So Dagny, who's kind of the hero of the story, she's traveling on this train, and she encounters this hobo whose name was Jeff Allen. And he used to once be a worker in what was what she calls a 20th century motor company. And so Jeff Allen tells her the story that the factory and the employees were the first one to use that iconic sentence from that book, who is John Galt, right? This is what that book is sort of famous for. And it turns out that 12 years before this encounter between Dagny and Jeff Allen, the company owner of 20th Century Motor Company had died and his heirs had taken over and the new owners had put into practice this plan. And it was based on this, and Ryan, Ayn Rand will call communist slogan, from each according to his ability and to each according to his need. Right? This was kind of the definition of 
Marxism, communism, and obviously it is redistribution, right? From each according to his ability and to each according to his need. So there was a young engineer who was the first one to quit because he was opposing the irrationality of redistribution. And this young engineer who was the first one to quit, who was going to stop, as it were, the motor of the world was John Galt. And this is the hero. So basically, the hero of Atlas Shrugged is the anti-redistributionist in the book, right? That the greatest evil and the reason that he has left and is encouraging the intelligentsia to leave is in order to fight redistribution because redistribution is seen as essentially Marxist and a social evil, right? So when you hear these days, you know, radio commentary on the conservative side, you will always hear that definition of communism, right? That each according to his ability and to each according to their need, and that is their definition of Marxism, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the first correction ought to come. It is true that from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs was a slogan that Karl Marx used. And he used it in the critique of the Gotha program in 1875. He was not the first person to use it, but he's the one that really popularized this slogan. And it was indeed used by the socialist movement, right? This idea of mm -hmm. each according to his ability and to each according to his need. And therefore, a lot of people took it to be the proper definition of communism and Marxism, redistribution, right? And that's why they're so opposed to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can see that that's not the case, right? Distributive justice has, as it were, even though Marx used it, not as a proper definition of Marxism or co communism or socialism, has within it this idea of redistributing and that it would be a just thing to do. Mm -hmm. So now we have to explain maybe an example of why this is not a proper definition of Marxism, if that's okay with you. Well, I mean, I think one is that Marxism is an anthropology too. I mean, it's much bigger than economics. And I think that's yeah. a huge problem in the, in the conservative movement. I mean, I mean, I think we're all guilty of that to a point. We're focused so much on the economics, we miss that it's an anthropological. But yes, please give me a definition of Marxism. Well, I, I will first explain why redistribution is not a Marxist concept and it is not a problematic issue regarding justice, right? The okay. assumption of Ayn Rand is that all redistribution is injustice per se, end of story, and therefore it must be fought as an injustice in society. So one example which you were mentioning already was the father and the family, right? So the father in the family, let's presume that he's the only one that has a job in this family, for example. So he is working according to his ability, and he is redistributing in his family in accordance with the need of different members of the family. And that makes complete sense that it would be so. There's no Wait a injustice. I'm a, so I'm a socialist. I mean, do I get like higher social credit score now? Okay, I'm just joking. Keep yeah. <laughs> uh, so there would be no injustice in that, Right. The father is giving to each one of his children in proportion to what they need. And obviously, some children would need more than others. Mm -hmm. And that's not just money, time, attention, et cetera, et cetera. Some may have special needs, right? So he's also just redistributing, as it were, his own time in the family. Mm -hmm. So it's not problematic at all. That's exactly what a father is supposed to do, right? Not just because of duties of justice, but duties, a higher virtue because of charity. But if he fails in charity, there's still duties of justice that oblige him, right? Distributive justice. It's the same case, for instance, in the monastery. In a monastery, the monks may join and renounce private property as individuals, though as a legal person, the monastery still owns private property. Right. They all work according to their ability and their gifts for the common good of the monastery, and the abbot redistributes to each monk according to their need. There's zero injustice in that matter. A final example of where distributive justice applies and where that type of justice rules certain institutions would be the church. Right? The church distributes grace freely in accordance with the need of the faithful. Right? It's not a commutative transaction. You are not buying masses or buying sacraments, et cetera, et cetera. It's a distribution in accordance to what the faithful may need. And there's no injustice in that whatsoever, right? 
So the point being that the injustice here is not in redistribution, and that is the error of so many conservatives and libertarians. The problem comes when we talk about redistribution. Redistribution itself doesn't say whether it's evil or good. The question is, who is redistributing, under what conditions, in what proportion, and for what reason and to whom are they redistributing? Right? It can be unjust redistribution, but it can also be perfectly just redistribution as the examples that I just gave. Mm-hmm. So that needs to be taken into account. Redistribution is not a proper definition of Marxism and communism. Redistribution could be perfectly sound and it could be also unjust. But for that, we must look to the, the particular circumstances of the redistribution. Okay, so let me say two things I want to talk. I'd like you to give that how you just a definition of Marxism. I think it's important to understand that second, but the other thing after that, I want you to, I want to ask the question. I think that would be on the minds of many like, okay, fine. But what about the state? Okay. This does the state have the ability to redistribute or now, like, how do we think about justice? Okay. Cause I think that would be a question people would have. They may be able to argue with you. I agree with you. Okay, fine. I'm fine with the family and the church and everything, but I'm opposed to the state rich redistributing. But again, well, I agree with you. That? So, so the first question is coming to clean up the idea that redistribution is somehow automatically an injustice, right? right. So I've just yep. demonstrated that that's not possibly the case at all, right? right? The relationship between a husband and a wife is not based on commutative transactions. Neither is the relationship of a father and a mother to their children based on a commutative exchange of goods or services, right? That's not what's occurring. Same in the monastery, same in the church, period. Okay. So it's an improper definition of communism and Marxism, and it's important to try to reach a proper definition to not make the mistake, right? Mm -hmm. In order to get to, you know, to have a proper definition of something is to really understand the nature of the thing that we're discussing. So you have to understand the essential elements of communism and Marxism, and you will see immediately that redistribution is not enough. So communism would have certain notes, which would be common also to socialism and Marxist ideology. And the first one would be that communism and Marxism is by definition an ideology that is a materialist ideology, dialectical materialism, if you want to be technical, but let's just say materialist ideology. Therefore, denying man's spiritual nature, the soul, God, and vehement opposition to religion and so forth, right? So de facto, that's kind of the first foundation stone to the definition. It is a materialist ideology. Second, we don't have time to go into all the ins and outs of dialectical materialism, but it is determinist in nature. And that's a very important thing to consider. Thirdly, the engine that is moving communism and Marxism, meaning the social order, it's evolving in a deterministic fashion, but the cause for the movement is economic struggles between classes. Very important. If you read Marxist theory, you will see that those who hold the means of production and the labor force are immediately at odds. There's kind of a culture of envy. And that is this conflict that is moving history forward and the economic order forward, right? The social progress towards communist paradise, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's based on social class hatred, as it were, immediately. Now, what is it moving towards? It's clear when you read Marxist literature, it's moving towards the dictatorship of the proletariat. So the end goal here, or the step before the end goal, is the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is why this is taking place, right? Once you get to the dictatorship of the proletariat, basically the state will wither and disappear into an egalitarian society. And that's where all will work voluntarily according to their ability, and all will take according to their needs. This is not the definition. This is really the consequence of the whole revolution in the end. That's how the world will look, right? Mm-hmm. When and Marxism with, is realized, when the communist exactly. dream is realized. Yeah. Exactly. That's when everybody working according to their abilities and taking according to their needs will take place. At the end of the whole story, right? Not at the beginning as a definitional point. And therefore, there would be the abolition of private property, right? Because everything will be held in common and communist paradise will have arrived. Everybody will work voluntarily according to their needs they will receive, right? 
it's also the disappearance of the rule of law at the end of the process, right? As Stalin once said, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a power which is restricted by no laws, hampered by no rules, and based directly upon violence. Mm -hmm. And in the process, in order to get there, because people voluntarily will not do this, as the history of communism shows, 100 million victims and counting, the abolition of all rights are going to come as a consequence, right? Private property, right of association, freedom of religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, mm -hmm. if you say all those things, you have a proper definition of Marxism and communism. If you just say redistribution is Marxism, it's an absurdity, and it's just an improper definition, completely partial, and doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think also the, 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 the I, I did a podcast with um, Gary Saul Morrison on thinking like Lenin, which I think is important, and also with uh, Carlo Lancelotti on the work of Augusto del Noce. We talk about some of like the, the what what communism is, et cetera. And I think the other thing is you know which you which you noted you know for there's a determinism, and this would in in a one Marxian ideal, this would just happen, right? This is how history is going. But you know sometimes you have to push history along, and so you have to kill millions of people to do it. And yes, that's, and that's what we saw. Um, and, and so I think I think it's I just want to affirm like something that's so very important. I mean, it is, it is materialist, it's determinist, it's atheistic, and it's not simply an economic system. And I, I think just from a little bit of a different angle, and I probably have talked about this on the podcast before, that I think this is an error that we've made so like conservatives have made is like, oh, the communism fell and now capitalism has won the day. But I think Ratzinger, who you mentioned earlier, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Augusto del Noche and others said, no, no, you, you don't mistake or identify Marxism, communism with one dimension of its economic position. It's a much broader anthropological social view than that. And I think yes. that's something that, that people miss. So I think that's why it's, it, that's another reason why it's actually not just historically relevant, but immediately politically and socially and culturally relevant to understand the broader view of what a Marxist or communist view of the world is. Yes. So the allergic reaction of many conservatives to the notion of redistribution is because they are not thinking correctly about all the other things that make Marxism Marxism. Mm -hmm. So when they hear that the notion of distributing common goods or goods that are held in common proportionally, and I'll talk about the state and distributive duties of justice that the state has, they immediately associate it with this. And I think as I said, conservative talk show hosts have done tremendous damage and cementing that idea in the minds of young conservatives, right? Yeah. Although today we're seeing a different move, I think, which we can talk about, where a lot of young conservatives are going to the other side and, and getting confused, I think, about, about the role of the state in the common good. And I think maybe identifying the political community with the common good. But right. maybe, let's pause. That. I mean, do you think that's wrong? And we can move to that So later. I want to make a couple of differences here. The state will also have duties of distributive justice. Yes. And that is also not a violation of justice if they right. observe due proportion and um, the right means to achieve that, right? So for instance, there are things that are important to every individual as part of the common good. For instance, the defense of the nation, right? The defense of your border so you don't get invaded by another country. That is not something that you can exercise as an individual, right? So the state has a duty and an obligation to guard and be vigilant of, you know, your jurisdiction, the, your sovereignty, and so forth, right? For instance, they have other duties of distributive justice. For instance, a tornado hits and destroys an entire city. Okay, there are people now in circumstances that have a need that I cannot supply for but the state could take care of or help alleviate, right? So they have a, mm -hmm. a duty and justice to go to their rescue or to aid them in that problem, right? Now, there's a difference though when a father or a monk or the church or an abbot in a monastery redistribute goods, right? Distributive justice and when the state does it. And that is what's really important here to maintain the distinction of when it becomes problematic when the state does it. And the difference here is clear. When a father redistributes goods in the family, he is doing the redistribution of things that belong to him, right? They're the fruits of his labor, right? 
the state receives, as it were, money, right? Not necessarily as a voluntary contribution, right? But as a matter of law and can be enforced by the power of coercion of the state if you don't pay taxes. So technically, the money is not theirs. They have money that is yours and they are redistributing that, but the money is technically not theirs. They did not produce that income, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one first distinction. It's not really truly theirs because they were not the ones that produced, you know, uh, the, the fr it's not the fruits of their labor. The second thing is that when you enter into, let's say, a monastery, you are doing it freely, right? If you renounce private property as a monk to yourself personally, you are doing so freely. No one's obliging you, and you decide to take that for spiritual reasons. You decide to live that life, right? And it's the same thing when it comes to, let's say, in the family, how the father and the mother perhaps decide to redistribute is completely up to their judgment and prudence and freedom, right? Thirdly, so the state, when they do this, they must be very, very prudent and careful when they do this because, first of all, they're doing it with money that is not theirs. Second, it wasn't really a free voluntary contribution. And thirdly, they must give the rationale and the, the ability for the citizens to understand how they're redistributing those goods, right? This is why transparency is so important. And when I hear discussions about transparency, it's always about the question to make sure that people are not stealing money. Okay, that's fine. But that's not the main reason why transparency is necessary. The main reason is because there's a duty of justice to be accountable for the money that is not yours and what you're doing with it. Clearly, stealing is a completely out of boundaries. But the other point is you must give a rational explanation of why that redistribution is taking place and how. Right? Okay. So I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I ask a question on that? Yes, please. Okay, so... How about what someone would argue on your point, first point? So technically, the money's not the state. And in one sense, that's pretty obvious, right? Because the state isn't producing Correct. anything, okay? But you could say, for example, you know, and I talk about this on sorts of embedded economics, that the state, that is the political community, okay? And we have to maybe make some distinctions here. Going back to your Aristotelian question right at the beginning, right? What, what, how do you form a political community, this idea of justice? The state creates the conditions... And again, the state are also people, but the state creates the conditions of rule of law, of defense, of security. And then because they're just, they're, there's a private property regimes and access to justice in the courts and the ability to engage in trade. And so in a sense, the state is a participant, that is a community participant investor in creating the conditions for, say, economic wealth creation, et cetera. So in a sense, could you say that the state is somehow owed something by the people in some type of justice relationship for the conditions that they've received and also to perpetuate those conditions for future generations? How, how do you articulate that? I, I would say that the rationale for somebody paying taxes has very little to do with the state being owed anything. Right. It has to do with the mind and the person, the individual perceiving that there are needs that the entire community must contribute to that are necessary for the common good. I mentioned some of them already. And also the ability for people to maybe even reach others who would be in need, which they themselves could not reach. So the rationale behind it is because it is just and it makes sense and it is rationally plausible that we are supplying part of our income in order to have those needs fulfilled, right? You can't go just build roads and highways and bridges on your own. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we do use them. So there's a rational use of that money for something that is also necessary for the common good and the end of each individual, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the rationale. And that's why it's important to have transparency on how the money is spent because it must be spent in a rational manner. But the second thing that the state must observe, and this is true of anybody practicing distributive justice, is that there must be a moral purpose for those funds when you redistribute. It is not licit for the state to take taxes and the funds of people who have earned it through their hard labor for an immoral purpose. 
A great example of that would be, for instance, the funding of private associations that are in the business of killing the unborn, right? You cannot use our funds for that purpose, right? Because we can't be implicated, and that is not something that is within the desire of any citizen of goodwill to give money in order to carry out the death of the unborn. So I say that the second that a state begins to do that, they relinquish their moral right to ask for those taxes and those funds. Because you cannot ask for money or take money from citizens to use them for an immoral purpose. Would you say all funds or just those funds? There would be a prudential question of whether you can calculate how much of those funds you want to hold back. But in general they have really violated kind of the covenant between the citizens and the state that the money that they are giving is clearly understood to be for a moral purpose, right? Mm -hmm. That would be one other thing they must observe. The second thing is the proportion. This is distributive justice. The proportion with which they distribute, but also the proportion that they take from other people, right? You can't just do this as you see fit or for every possible need or for every possible imaginary thing that you think requires money and raise the proportion of taxes on citizens based on that, right? So there must be the proper mean of how much of their income you're going to extract, right? And that is something that doesn't seem to be considered, right, at all. Mm -hmm. So if the state doesn't observe those conditions, they're definitely going to be incurring injustices when they redistribute. Right. Okay. And so just very quickly, I don't, I don't, because I think this was, I think we should talk about this maybe in more detail later. So, so we can go on to the big picture still, but I do think like, I think just as Aquinas says, right, you, there are laws that are unjust that you must not obey. And then there are laws that are unjust that you should just briefly obey and try to change them. Right. So maybe briefly is the wrong word, but that you should obey, you know, for a while and then try to change them. And so in a sense that that's part, that's also part of that's why there's a responsibility for citizens to change the laws uh, and, and stop that's this time of like uh, this type of appropriation of, of taxes and then use for fundamentally immoral things. For instance, right, that would not be the only example, but of course it it is the duty of the entire community to seek to restore justice where laws are not just, right? Correct, yeah. So the abuse of the notion of redistribution is what creates the problem. And of course, in communism, Marxism, and socialism, this will be the end game, right? There will no longer be any private property, which is a violation of natural fundamental rights of a human person. But there's the other extreme of those who have missed distributive justice as a species and think that the only thing that operates in the world is commutative justice, meaning there's exchanges for services and goods, and that's how every institution in in a free society operates. And a great example to illustrate the problem is Gary Becker, Mm -hmm. right? Gary Becker in 1960 wrote a famous paper called an economic analysis of fertility. You might be familiar with this paper. There was a great acclaim in the academic community after he wrote the paper. And Gary Becker, for those who don't know, is an American economist. He won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1992. And he argued in several papers that many different types of human behavior can be seen as a rational and utility maximizing effort or enterprise. And I think that paper on an economic analysis of fertility shows the problem of somebody who sees the world merely as a commutative transaction ordeal, as it were. So the question for Becker in this paper is, he's trying to solve a problem, the inability of demographers to predict Western birth rates accurately, right? That's his problem. So essentially, he's asking the question, right? The essence of the inquiry is, why are people having babies? So if you read the paper, you will see the problem because he is thinking that everything is basically a free market transaction and a commutative transaction. So he starts talking about why parents are having babies. So he starts with this uh, presupposition. I assume initially he writes that each family has perfect control over both the number and spacing of its births. Because this is first necessary model is that that's not moving, right? That's perfectly calculated and there's never any such thing as surprise births, right? Which already you're in, you know, you're already in the ivory tower, right? Uh, Textbooks are not reality. Right. 
for most parents, here comes the utility maximizing, because his theory will be that parents are having children because of some kind of utility maximizing purpose. For most parents, children are a source of psychic income, he writes, or satisfaction, right? And in the economist terminology, children would be considered a consumption good, right? You can see, right? It's the objects. Just for the record, I mean, I did not know how much psychic income I had. <laughs> exactly. No wonder why I don't have any money. It's all, it's all psychic. <laughs> yes. Start enjoying your psychic income, right? Oh, That's what yeah, you're I getting. Enjoy, yeah. He, one of my... One of my psychic incomes broke one of my nice coffee cups this morning, but right. he won, so I forgave him. So his first thesis is a consumption good, basically, is a service or something that is being used for direct satisfaction, right, of the individual needs of the consumer. So it's their individual satisfaction that they get psychic satisfaction from having children. That's the reason that they're having them psychic income, as he calls it, right? <laughs> but he goes further, right? The children can also be a production good. Right. And that's basically an expected profit motive or expected return on an investment, basically. And he writes as follows Children may sometimes provide money, income, and are then a production good as well. Moreover, neither the outlays on children nor the income yielded by them are fixed by vary in the amount with the child's age, making children a durable consumption and production good. Right. So, Wow. Children, he writes, this is really amazing that he was, he was lauded for this paper. Children are morally the same as those associated with other durables, right? And he compares them to cars and says this, a family must determine not only how many children it has, but also the amount spent on them, right? Whether it should provide separate bedrooms, send them to the nursery school, private colleges, give them dance or music lessons. I will call more expensive children higher quality children, just as, just as Cadillacs are called higher quality cars than Chevrolets. To avoid any misunderstanding, he writes, let me hasten to add that higher quality does not mean morally better. If more is voluntarily spent on one child than another, it is because the parents obtain additional utility from the additional expenditure and it is in this additional utility, which we call higher quality. His conclusion, the marginal utility from spending a dollar more on the quantity of children must equal the marginal utility from spending a dollar more on their quality. They would have additional children whenever they expected utility per dollar of expected cost, right? From an additional child were greater than that from expenditures elsewhere. So Becker is arguing that really parents are in a massive free market commutative transaction expecting returns, and that is what's determining, besides the psychic income, which is already a problem, expecting return from the child, and that's why they're investing time in their children, completely missing the notion of distributive justice, right? That you're spending more time on the child because that is what is owed to that child who needs their parents. Right. I mean, first of all, I've got to go right now and give a lecture to my children they need to be a lot more productive because their psychic income is waning and I need more, I need to, I need more durable stuff from them. No, but I think, I mean, it's also, by the way, I mean, this is not our topic, but it's also fundamentally inhuman. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't take into account the embodied embedded person. I have a, a podcast I did with Carter Sneed where he, you know, we have to talk about expressive individualism and it's a certain, it's, it's expressive individual, which really affects the law, in fact, which is related to justice, but that it doesn't take into account really a, 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 a human way. It's a dehumanized way of seeing the world. And so it's economism, right? It's an ideological way of seeing it. So it's both an error in justice and an error in so many other uh, so many other ways. But I think I think it's important that you bring that out, right? Because think about it. You know, this kind of thinking of children in utilitarian terms is is problematic and it's an error of So ex so exactly the point. If you miss that distributive justice is part of what rules certain exactly. institutions, all you have is commutative justice and then you see the analysis of Becker, right? It, that's what it becomes. Yep. You're just trading objects for objects or services, you know, in order to maximize utility, etc., right? At a popular level, I mean, Ayn Rand outside of her novels wrote about this idea, right? One of her books, The Virtue of Selfishness, right, where Ayn is praising 
this idea that you're talking about individualism, not in the proper sense of individualism and freedom, but in the sense of the virtue of selfishness, right? Right. And for her, the moral person in summary was someone who acts and is committed to acting in their best self-interest always. And that it was by living this kind of morality of self-interest that one would survive, flourish, and achieve happiness. And for her, selflessness, this idea of charity or distributive justice, she considered the deepest form of immorality. Right. Here's a person that's completely lost the notion of justice at the distributive level, let alone the virtue of charity and love, which is what really governs family, monastery, and church. Absolutely. And, 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 and this is, I think, where if you look at the writings of Carol Wojtyla, John Paul II, right? One of the key themes from his book, Love and Responsibility, to all, all through, his, through his encyclical writings as Pope, right, is this human beings are not objects to be manipulated. Exactly. Human beings are subjects to be respected. And that this whole concept of love is a concept of self-donation, which is gift, right? And then, and that the, and then the other thing, which um, I've talked about on the podcast a couple of times, I need to do a whole podcast to write an essay. I got to finish this essay on, on, on this on George Orwell, it's 1984, and Carol Wojtyla's Love and Responsibility. Uh, tenderness is the great resistance to totalitarianism, and totalitarians hate tenderness. And so the uh, the irony, of course, with um, Ayn Rand and and this idea of Altruism as bad, selflessness as bad, is this kind of Tocquevillian insight, right? Which is that, and I talked about this all the time on the podcast, that individualism leads to centralization, and centralization wants to encourage and and and, and broaden individualism. And so you have these little tiny individuals, and now you have a massive state. And so the the, the kind of the irony of the the irony of the anti-communist, anti-statist is that the promoter of individualism ultimately promotes the centralized state. I think it's a very interesting point because uh, Chambers in his remarkable review of Atlas Shrugged, which is what, which is called um, Big Sister is Watching Us, right? And That's which <laughs> which drove Ayn Rand frantic when it came out. And Bill Buckley once told the story that after that review, whenever she was invited somewhere, if she had any suspicion whatsoever that Bill Buckley was going to be there, she would call in advance. And if Bill Buckley was going to show up, she just would refuse to go, right? And uh, in that was that, very selfish of her. I like it. <laughs> in that analysis, Chambers insightfully makes the point that the materialism of Ayn Rand is no different at the bottom than the foundational idea of Marxism, right? right? They have the wrong concept of human nature and they're completely materialist. And the idea of self-satisfaction, right? And the pursuit of just mere self-satisfaction is something that really is problematic also in Marxism, right? Even though they may disagree, as he rightly says in the review, at the top on their ends of why they're doing this, right? And they are at foundational philosophical level, starting from the same principle. It's materialist through and through. Right. Yep. In the case of Ryan, her, Ayn Rand, her goal is obviously this idea of maximizing profit and productivity of man as the highest and most noble achievement of man, as she writes. Right. Mm -hmm. That is your highest achievement. And you can see this in the last line of Atlas Shrugged, where the hero of the story is tracing in the dirt the dollar sign. Right. It reminds me of that Latin motto in Constantine's life, in hoc signo vincis, right? right? Under this sign, you will triumph. And now it's not the cross, it's the dollar sign, right? And, and it's interesting because the, 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 what we see, in a sense, is the combination. I mean, this again, Ratzinger and Solzhenitsyn were just on, is we see the combination, in a sense, of what you could call a this kind of hedonistic individualistic materialist capitalism mixing with with hedonistic materialist communism and you get this expressive individualism where you follow your passions increase the amount of pleasure you have and everyone's an object in the game of life right and um and this again i talked to carter sneed about this in detail so if you're interested in this listeners we actually talk we have a long conversation about this it's a problem and this is where like ratzinger i think it was in maybe 90 or something said that 
after, and I talk about this a lot, so listeners will have heard this quote. So it's because I think it's just so important and so insightful to our time that after the fall of the Soviet Union, relatives didn't die. It combined with a desire for gratification to form this potent mix. And so now you have these kind of like deracinated individuals. And so that the poor, the homeless, the unborn, the sick, the elderly, they're just objects in the way of your, you know, kind of life passion, your life goals. And this is, this is, it's, it's deeply problematic. And so I think in a sense, like this goes back to something that's really a theme of the whole podcast is that a lot of it, we're in an anthropological battle about what does it mean to be a human being? And I think this is why it's so important how you talked about it's metaphysical justice. We have to start there, uh, seeing the world as it is. So Um, I wanted to make a point about that if I could, Michael. So, uh, Obviously, it, the reason that the reengineering of society and mankind under communism is possible is because of the philosophical anthropological error, as you say, at the, at the start, that man is just material, right? Man is just matter. If man were just matter, yes, you could reengineer and mold man as you please. But since that is incorrect, and man has a free will and human dignity and reason, that's why it's not giving to the kind of being what is owed. That kind of being is not material, right? You just have to observe it, right? And if you do that, you will commit tremendous injustices because you're incorrect about the nature of reality, right? That's the first thing. Mm-hmm. But the second thing is the opposing view of justice today, which I wanted to get to, which is yes, kind yeah. of a Rawlsian idea, right? I would say credited probably mostly in academia to John Rawls, who was at Harvard. And Rawls writing about justice is transforming the notion of justice as we just described it into what he will call political justice. Mm -hmm. And what he is doing is saying that it is not possible, let's say before a law is passed as an example, to determine antecedently before you pass the law, what is just and what is unjust. Mm -hmm. So because he doesn't believe in metaphysical realities for many reasons that I don't have time to talk about now in postmodernism, right? The mind cannot read the, reach the object. They cannot understand reality. So we have no way of determining what is real and what is not real and what is owed to natures and things and beings. So we have no way of determining justice antecedently. So how do we ter- determine justice? And that's why the w- word political is important. It is a modifier to justice. Meaning through a political process, meaning it's in the vote, it's in the procedure of the Supreme Court, it's in the vote of the parliament, the Reichstag, right? Whatever the result is, as long as the procedure is fair, that result will be the determination of justice. That it is that way that we determine what truth is, not in our adequation of reason to reality. It's in the procedure being fair. And as long as you get a procedure that is fair, not rigged, that is how you determine what justice is. Ergo, it will be a variable result, right? Now we're back to Nietzsche, where he says that Western civilization will be rolling towards X, meaning to a variable X which we could fill with anything, right? It's not possible to have a common sense and a common understanding of justice if justice depends on a procedure because a procedure could yield anything, right? And that's what we're seeing. Procedural democracies have replaced the paradigm shift. The classical notion of democracy, which was concerned with true justice and laws to maintain the order and the proper interaction between individuals, the state and the citizen. So now the result of that procedure could be anything. And that for Rawls would be the determination of justice, whatever that procedure leads. And that is the big dramatic change between what I would call a metaphysical philosophical grounded democracy and one that is completely postmodern based on a procedure where there is no stable objectivity to justice. So there's no possible common understanding of justice because we never know what it's going to be. Right. You're just Mm -hmm. rolling towards variables that could happen at any time, completely subjective and completely relative. That's the dictatorship of relativism that Benedict is talking about. It doesn't require a dictator to be in the problem. It's that the law now will just be dictated according to a procedure, not derived from a higher law of reason, natural law, some call technically, or even the eternal law. 
the dictates of a parliament will be what is just. And that's what the dictatorship really is about. Whether you have a dictatorship by arms or not is secondary. Right. That's exactly right. And, and I see, and I'm referring to this Carter Sneed episode, you know, and he makes this point, you know, that expressive individualism, okay, if that's how you want to live and you're going to just follow your passions and do whatever you want, okay, but you should be nowhere near the law. And unfortunately, that's really increasingly writing our law. And this is why it's becoming very dangerous to be, or already is dangerous to be unborn, weak, Down syndrome, elderly, you know, that gets in the way of people's search for their their passion. I mean, clearly there's a valid way in which you can you speak of individualism, right? It's very necessary in the sense for entrepreneurship and the rest. But the thing is that your individualism is not the determination of law, nor is it of a minority, that there are antecedent principles that have to be observed. So any law that is passed against that is going to be by definition an unjust law. It doesn't fit the proper definition of law. And to deny that would to be to say that things like the Nuremberg laws passed by the Nazis were just because they were passed, right? That's what Rawls would have to eventually say, because the procedure was correct. This is the determination of justice, which no one believes. And that was, of course, the Nuremberg defense. We were doing something that was legal and we were being commanded by our superiors. That didn't work, right? There was a higher law. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so, exactly. And so I think like on the individuals, right. I was talking about a certain Tocquevillian individualism, not that each individual is unique and unrepeatable and has dignity and has agency, et cetera, that if you want to talk about that. And then I also, I think you're saying too, to be clear, it doesn't mean that there's no place for procedures or rule of law. It's that you can't simply have procedures as the guard. There must be an antecedent that's before that. And this- well- Yeah, there are things that are completely procedural in a democracy, right? To give you a small example, what should the speed limit be is not based on looking on the nature of things. It's just basically legal justice in a sense, right? Positive law, right? It could be 55 or it could be the Autobahn in Germany that has no speed limit. Okay, that's not violating the nature of reality, right? Right. But when it comes to fundamental rights, it's not based on consensus and it's not based on a democratic vote and it is not based on a procedure. It's based on this is owed to that person or this is owed to that being. And that is not something that is a proper object of choice. Right. As I say, a referendum, let's say, on abortion or killing the unborn is by definition an anti-democratic referendum because nobody has a right to vote on that. This is not a decision of the majority that we will decide who lives and who dies, that is not an object, properly speaking, of what is choice, right. not within your jurisdiction to, to do that. Right. And that's that line from Rats. There are some things that a majority has no right to annul. Right. So let me ask you a very quick technical question, because I just don't want to forget. And then if you can do it very fast. You don't have to spend a lot of time, but I, I, I want to address it. And then I want to go to, you've talked about kind of the errors of commutative justice. There's also people who erroneously apply distributive justice and maybe don't fully realize that there's a realm of commutative justice. So let let me start just with a quick technical question. And then this is, so you, it, earlier when you're talking about distributive justice, you talk about how we have to be, we're attentive to the person in the distribution. In the treatise on justice, St. Thomas Aquinas has a question, uh, 63, is of respect of persons. And should there be respect to persons? The answer is no, you should not respect persons. Okay. And this means like goes from, you know, Deuteronomy from Leviticus, that there should be impartiality in the law. It's very important for, for how to think about law and rule of law. So could you just maybe, again, this is a bit technical. You don't need to go into the weeds on yeah. it, but could you just make the distinction? Like how, what's the difference between not respecting persons? That is it's impartial and the case where you have to take the personal into account. And I think this is obvious in the family, but maybe less so in the state, right? Because the point of like, in a sense, impartiality is that you don't, there's no benefits just because you're poor and there's no benefits for the crony capitalists who have all the connections. The justice and law should be executed without partiality, right? So maybe just make that, how, how do we think about that? Okay. Yeah, I I think it's, um, I mean, probably we have to clarify what it means not to respect persons because people would presume that respect not respecting persons would be, you know, to right. be insulting or, you know, we don't mean that at all, as you know. Right. right. So I respect Th- you. I just don't respect you. Yeah. No, wh- what St. Thomas is pointing to, for instance, would be the problem of you're giving something a privilege or you're giving somebody something that is not due to them because of who they are. 
for instance, a good example would be nepotism. Not because they would be good for the job, not because they would serve the community, not because they're qualified, but because they happen to be your nephew. That that would be an injustice based on respect of person, right? For instance. Or that you discriminate against the poor because they are poor, right? Or that you show undue deference towards somebody who is rich just because they are rich, right? That you're no longer looking at the conditions of the person per se. You're looking at the respective person, right? Or that a politician will be favorable to me if I do him this favor, and then you're compromising justice in order to accrue that uh, interest of the politician in you, for instance. Right. And this were racism, for example. You, you, you deny people services because – or you, you deny them like the right to vote or whatever it might be. Or you do experiments on them, medical experiments on them because they're poor and foreign. So, yeah, that would be it. But the fact that you're poor may fulfill some of the conditions by which you might have something that is required in distributive justice. So that probably would not be one of the conditions, right? Um, The distinction would be that you perhaps care about the poor only in your district if you're a senator or a congressman, right? And Mm -hmm. don't care about anybody else just because they happen to vote for you if you continue to give them money or continue to do something in your own community. And there's maybe a greater need that you should be trying to help fulfill, but you don't because you're just interested in continuing to promote yourself, right? Right. For instance. Yes. Yeah. And by by the way, when I said experimenting on the poor, I meant like, you know, some of the, some of the unapproved medicines or, you know, some of the sterilization that we've done to poor people because they're poor. So they're different. So that's in a sense, it's, it's, it's injustice because of who they are. But I do think, so just really quickly. So, but there could be a case, right? Where you get distributive justice because you're poor, right? Or because you've just had a tornado gone through your your city. Absolutely. Right. Because of that, you potentially would be owed help from the larger community, right? And from individuals, right? So your That's situation clear. and conditions matter. And this is different from false partiality. It's of course. Right. Okay. But okay, sorry. So that's that was a technical. I thought I mean, I know it's a little technical, but I thought it would just be worth making that articulation. Okay. Or that for instance, you don't prosecute Republicans because they're Republicans, right? That would be looking at the person, not on the issue of justice of what is due to them, right? For right, instance, right? right? So, just so, because they're yeah. part of your party. So yeah. this like uh, extreme partisanship in our days that doesn't look to the reality of the conditions, but they just simply are for their tribe is one of the problems that we're dealing with constantly on injustices on all sides. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's a good example. Okay. So let's, let's move then to this question here on the errors of distributive justice, right? That sometimes, for example, give Gary Becker, his case is he applied commutative justice to the family, which is a place for distributive justice. What are some of the cases, Marcel, where people are applying distributive justice, maybe to places where it should be commutative justice. I think this gets into into some of the economic questions. Well, I mean, I think there's a whole plethora of people, perhaps, that are disregarding commutative justice that is necessary, for instance, in the free market to really maintain freedom and justice. And even some forms of socialism Right. There's some forms of socialism that that intend the revolution. Right. So I remember one person describing what is socialism and they were saying communism is just socialism with claws. Right. So that's one side of the problem. The other side of the problem is perhaps those who are not advocating armed revolution or that part of the problem, but they're advocating the state being the owner of the means of production and the ones in charge of total redistribution kind of as their end. Right. Obviously, if you don't keep proportion, that's why distributive justice is based on proportion. You're obviously making errors and committing errors. You know, that could be maybe the Labour Party in England, for instance, would be maybe a more benign example of the problem. Extreme welfare state kind of situations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. But you would have to look look case by case. Yeah. This sort of idea that the free market is going to run on some central authority that is going to redistribute commodities and you know sort of drive the economy is going to be a problem. And we don't have to guess. Every place where communism ruled, it bankrupted the economy, 
not did it just not only did it bankrupt the economy in many countries, it's just utter poverty was the consequence of it, right? Look at Venezuela, for instance, right? One of the richest countries in 1980s, and now you can't even find toilet paper and you have to stand in line for every single product, right? They're going to make huge mistakes. And this is where the critique of the Austrian School of Economics was valid. And for instance, if you think about Hayek and his fatal conceit, right? For instance, mm -hmm. and the road to serfdom, of course, one of the critiques was that the state is not omniscient, meaning that they cannot calculate for the entire economy and that they're going to start making mistakes and causing injustices, surpluses where they're not needed and shortages because they are not operating through the forces of supply and demand. And this is clearly the problem, right? That no central authority could calculate for an economy. And when they try to do that, they're just going to crash the economy, right? It's just an absurd thing to do. But the critique is not valid in those institutions that we spoke about, namely the family, a right. monastery, and the church. Why? Because you can definitely calculate when it is not a macroeconomy. Mm -hmm. Right. If it's a small number of monks in a monastery, 29, 30 monks, you can definitely calculate for their needs and redistribute and maintain justice. But you can't do that for an entire country, and you certainly can't do that for the entire world. That's not possible, right? Mm -hmm. So it is possible to calculate, but it is not possible for, for the state to calculate because, as they rightly said, the state is not omniscient. They cannot see all the possible variables that goes even into producing even one pencil, as Milton Friedman used to show that example. All the factors that go into producing one pencil are impossible for the state to calculate. Mm -hmm. So you'll destroy the economy by excessive intervention, right? And your redistribution will commit injustices in trying to do so because people are not willingly, voluntarily going to give you all the fruits of their labor, right? It would be a tremendous injustice against them. And it has led to violence um, almost everywhere where this was tried, right? Total expropriation of the means of production. Yep. Yep. Let me ask two, let me go to, I have two things around, uh, around, um, distributive justice that are maybe related more theologically. Okay. How do we think about these questions with justice and and maybe we'll we'll kind of end here and then this will be an opening to our next discussions on justice where we're going to talk about now that we've got some of this work done we'll talk about some more provocative applications right about justice how to think about capitalism how to think about market economies uh, justice how to think about gender identity all these things I think are, are, are related to justice. And we, we want to talk about some of those too, because I think having a proper understanding of justice helps us work through some of these things. But let me, let me ask here on this, on there's some theological questions like around distributive justice. I mean, you know, a lot of people, you know, think Pope Francis is a communist. Mm -hmm. now, he's a communist. You hear it all the time, but he's really, he's not a communist, right? I mean, and he's not a socialist. And we know, we know he's not a socialist and a communist, a Marxist because of what we just laid out, what communism is, right? He's not a materialist. He's not a determinist, et cetera. And so like, I think I've, I've heard you say this is like, what are the errors people are getting is that Francis's position, if you, and it's his, is that he uses distributive justice, maybe where he should be using commutative justice, right? He kind of sees the world, maybe a better say, he sees the world as a cleric through distributive justice. And not as much, maybe through commutative justice, as he should. I don't. I don't I mean, how how would you articulate that? Like, because I think that that's a that's a confusion there. And then I have other theological questions. I would definitely object to saying that he sees the world as a cleric and therefore misses the idea of commutative justice. Because I happen to be a cleric, and I am for the free markets, and and was in fact one of the people who founded the free market roadshow and went to many, many dozens of capitals around Europe talking about the importance of free markets because they're in accordance with man's dignity and proper to an economy. So it's not because you're a cleric that you- Oh, my anti-clericalism. You just, you just smack down yeah. my, what St. Jose Maria calls a healthy dose of anti-clericalism. Right. You that you, just because you're a cleric, you start <laughs> like making errors in economics. So I just like, <laughs> let's dismiss that. I definitely it think that- It happens though. It happens. The oh, sure, but not because you're a cleric. It happens because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. okay, keep going. So I would say that he definitely, well, for instance, Rush Limbaugh said openly that, you know, yeah, yeah. Pope Francis is a Marxist, you know, everything that's coming out of his mouth is Marxism. And I think it's because of the problem of redistribution and 
And because there's a massive intellectual crisis in the conservative movement today, if you hear some of the voices, I don't even know them all, but you know, these people like Joe Rogan and Sean Hannity, Candace Owens, I mean, it's really, if you just even take a look at their formation, they're completely unqualified to be giving their the formation of so many minds that consume this stuff on a daily basis on economics to politics to ethics to everything else that itself is a problem that we have so many young people today that are being formed by these people i don't mean to do an ad hominem here but i mean joe rogan was a comedian. Well, I mean, he would yeah he's not a conservative i don't think so Regardless of that, he is highly, you know, uh, observed by many conservatives. Let me ask you this. What do you think are some of the kind of ideas about that are getting people confused about how to understand, how to think about justice that you've already talked about? And then going back to like, Francis, what would you say would be a proper critique of maybe how Francis sees the economy? I would say that definitely, I mean, as somebody who mostly moves in in the case of Pope Francis, in thinking about reality as distributive justice obligations, right, as head of the Catholic Church. His emphasis is going to be on that, you know, and sometimes perhaps it's perceived as being contrary to the notion of certain things operate according to commutative justice, right? So, it would possibly be a valid critique to say, you know, the emphasis needs to be that there's two species of justice and whatever we do and whenever we speak, we must make proper distinctions of when those are needed. Obviously, because he is an advocate for the poor and the needy, Mm -hmm. he's going to be thinking about that uh, to a large degree, but he also has to think, and I don't necessarily think that he doesn't, but he also has to think carefully about how free market economies work, especially in a global economy. I mean, this is vital, right? To abandon free market economies will be the destruction of the economic order, which would be a catastrophe for the poor and for everybody else, right? I think these mistakes are being made largely, as I said, because there's an intellectual crisis in the conservative movement. I think it's bankrupt intellectually. And I have mentioned already that A lot of this talk radio, I think, is doing tremendous damage because these people are totally unqualified to be talking about these things and unable to make these distinctions. So, and ultimately, they're unqualified to talk about justice, is what you think, right? Or, or I think they're unqualified, and you know, philosophically, and ethically, theologically, and even historically, to understand a lot of these things. So, it's a simplified version of reality that doesn't comport with all the necessary distinctions that are necessary in order to understand problems clearly. So they are creating, as it were, and St. Thomas is interesting in this because he says justice is not an issue of passion. It's an issue of reason. Mm -hmm. But they are agitating the passions of their listeners as opposed to informing their minds how to think correctly about matters. And the reason that it's so much easier just to agitate passions is because it requires zero intellectual formation and qualifications to do so. Anybody can do so, right? So that, I think, is part of the problem. The sources of wisdom in the West regarding all these questions is not going to be found on talk radio. Right. You're going to have to read books or talk to people. Moral Imagination Podcast. Yes. For instance, right? Wisdom (laughs) is not being derived probably through any of these superfluous podcasts, as I call them at the beginning uh, of your show. Uh, Yeah. You have to read books. You have to think, you know. And I think this point with Pope Francis is a good one because I think it's so easy just to immediately say, oh, he's a socialist. Like, no. Okay. Maybe, maybe he's make errors economically. And I think you're saying, you know, he's seeing things from, you know, his position in distributive justice as the Pope, but also he's, I think, making us aware of the poor, right? We have to be attentive to the poor. You know, I remember some people were really upset when he's like, you know, people think more about this new product offered to them than they do about the homeless man. I'm like, that's because it's true. We're much more concerned about that than we are concerned about the poor. And that's, that's part of it. So I think, but I think it's an interesting way to look at some of the ways we think about economics is that we don't want to overly apply commutative justice to distributive situations, and we don't want to apply distributive situations to commutative exchange because there is a place. 
somebody said to me, like, you know, they, they would call, like, they would kind of say, like, are you a free market fundamentalist? Because I think, and we can have a, let's have, I, I'm kind of pushing this aside because we've already gone a long time. We'll have a conversation what we mean by the market and another uh, podcast. But, but I think, like, well, I mean, you know, do you think there should be a place for you and I to start a business? And do we have to get like approval from the, you know, industrial policies are for to start a private business? I mean, is, are you saying that there's no place for commutative justice and exchange in a market economy? And of course there is, right? So now we have to talk about those in like more details, but first we need to make those distinctions. And that's really what I wanted to do in this podcast is really focus on those distinctions between commutative justice and distributive justice. So let me finish here with this question, and maybe this will open us up as we go for the to as we. And I'm, I'm grateful for your time, and and I'm glad My we're. Pleasure. I'm glad we're going to have a couple of these things, and and including talking about some provocative issues. But I think having this as a as a ground is just really helpful, and it's been really helpful for me. You know, I mean, I've read Thomas and everything, but just kind of reviewing, thinking about justice, and I. I'll, I'll have more questions as I as I go through. Let me talk about this question on, on wealth and justice. That there's a sense to, not just with Francis, but with the entire tradition, whether it's John Chrysostom or Basil or whatever, that in a sense, if somebody's poor, you don't own that coat. It's theirs. Right? If somebody's poor, you don't you don't own it. Now, and then Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira, it's yours. You can do with it what you want. And so there's this tension in how we think about distribution and justice and poverty and wealth. And it's not just the wealthiest uh, 1%. I mean, most of us in the United States, or at least a, a, a large large percentage of the United States are quite wealthy and have superfluous, not just podcasts, but goods. How do we think about those questions in relationship to commutative justice, distributive justice, and also charity and concern for the poor? I would start by saying that I, I don't think that uh, free markets and commutative justice are anathema in places like, you know, the Vatican or the Holy See. I lectured at the Academy of Sciences of the Vatican on free markets and this whole problem. It's not so much that. It's that you should read what Francis says with an understanding of that vision of his emphasis, which is what he does, because that is you know, as a religious leader of the church, that's what he's thinking about, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the critique should be perhaps attenuated, I would say. Clearly, for the reasons that we said, it's obvious that he's not a Marxist, he's not a materialist, yeah. and all the things that you said. That's an absurd critique, which far too many people are making. Now, as regards to what you just mentioned, <clears throat> One has to distinguish a homily that is being given to the actual distinctions that would be made when one speaks of that which is owed to the poor and that which is owed to others, right? Clearly, and by the way, sorry, the, sorry, just to, to be for listeners, the homily you're talking about John Chrysostom and St. Basil. Yes, right? Yeah, yeah. right. So the exhortation has to be taken in context and it also has to be taken as this is not something that is full of distinctions on all the possible particular problems that are presented. I was exhorting people to be generous to the poor. I get it, right? So I don't think that that's a good measure of the understanding of the church regarding social justice or any other problem just there. I would say that... Um, of course, the church is inimical to the abolition of private property, right? Considers it a Absolutely. great evil, right? And has written extensively about that. It is also not inimical to money or to somebody producing wealth. Obviously not. The church in the medieval period and other periods during our Western civilization was a huge engine of the economy. So in, if you think about the Catholics involved in the free market system and even the international banking system, such, such as the Medici family, I mean, the first sort of international banking system was being done by Catholics, right? So all of this is not really a problem. It's a consideration of, you know, our obligation in justice to consider the needs of others whether there is a legal obligation to do so or not as Christians, right? So whether you have impunity or not in doing so, that know that you're still accountable to a higher court, as it were, right? Because your charity and your justice towards the poor and those who have less is derived 
if you want theologically, since you're speaking about this topic theologically, from an obligation to love your neighbor as self. Right? And this was revolutionary in Western society, right? When the gospel came, it civilized nations and it achieved for, achieved, for instance, the abolition of slavery in Europe by the 10th century because of the equality of human beings, right? So you had an obligation to try to lift the poor, alleviate poverty and so forth. But it's also clear in the gospel, Christ said, that the poor will always be with you. So when you get utopians like Muhammad Yunus and others who claim that they're going to abolish poverty completely, money will not be necessary, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. These are like utopian dreams. Our duty is to help alleviate poverty, but to completely eradicate the needs of others will never be the case, right? This would be the utopian paradise that the communists were pretending to create. Everybody would be equal and have everything they needed, and instead they created an equal community of suffering and poverty and you know misery and death right so yeah you have to see what those duties are and it's definitely the case that if you have excess you really should think about the duties towards other people who have less you happen to have been blessed or been able to produce wealth that sustains you and your family yeah you should consider the poor right so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. And I think that's a question of prudence, and it's a question of other virtues, generosity, mm -hmm. liberality, and magnanimity, which would be a greater extent of charity towards others than liberality, right? Yeah. yeah. And that we will be accountable, no question about it, if you're speaking about it theologically. Right. Yeah. Good. No, I just think, I think it's good. That's a good, I want to just touch on that because I think this is where there's sometimes confusion about justice and how we think about things and, and then our duties of charity and broadly how we're supposed to treat our fellow human beings and especially with deep concern for the poor. So yeah, that's, um, I think it just, sometimes there's confusion around that. So I just wanted to bring that up towards the end of justice. All right. So, so I just want to say one last thing, if I may. Sure. So the obligation to help the poor, right. Is definitely an, a law of the gospel, right. To care for the yeah. poor and to care for the needy. But the definition of the particulars on how you do that is not defined, right? That is something that you must decide based on prudence and based on your love of neighbor on how you go about doing that. That cannot be legislated. This must be done because it depends on the particulars of the circumstance and the particulars of the person and the particulars of the person who is donating to the poor. So you can only in the general sense say that we must have charity towards the poor and do something about their needs, right? You fed me when I was hungry, right? You gave me to drink when I was thirsty, et cetera, et cetera. How you live that is going to be something that your freedom and prudence are going to have to determine. Mm -hmm. right. You can't legislate on that. Well, and I think too that, and this maybe we can talk about it in another time, is that there's a an error of identifying like personal responsibility with state or community responsibility and identifying the community with the political community. So there's not just individuals and families, but there's civil associations and churches and all these sure. responsibilities. And I think what sometimes is we, we end up in this, in, in almost, it's kind of like the same irony, right? That we're either in a kind of a hyper commutative justice where there's the individual and everything's commutative and, and like, you know, and everything's kind of individual and the state, or we're in like a hyper distributive view where we over emphasize, say, the role of the state in justice and charity and under emphasize the role of the person and the family and the community and the monastery in their distributive sure. role. There are so private think, organizations besides the state and the individual. Exactly. And there's a higher virtue than justice, which is charity. I may not owe you that coat, but I may still give it to you because of a higher virtue that is ruling my life, namely charity towards my neighbor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a commutative obligation. I may not even have necessarily a distributive obligation, but there is still a higher virtue, which is charity. You might have a distributive ob obligation. Yeah, you have to think about it. So it depends on the particulars and the circumstances. I can't tell you in general for everybody how that would be.
Right. Great. Okay. Marcel, thank you very, very much. It's super thank fun. Thank you, Michael. We're definitely going to come back, have you back, and we'll talk about more things with justice. And this is, a, I think, a very helpful for me, as I said. I hope it's helpful to the listeners. So um, I'll put links up to all of those things that we talked about from Big Sister is watching us to um, some of the other things you mentioned, Plato, Aristotle, the poem by Yeats, and, and onward. But So again, Marcel, thanks for coming on The Moral Imagination. Thank you for having me, Michael.